I'm just going to go turn off my halo. Okay, that's better. Um, and more appropriate given what this video is going to be. Um, and I just want to apologize if there's uh, lawnmower noise in the background. There's really nothing I can do about that in summer. Uh, in Edmonton, we have two seasons, winter and work, so, or construction, uh, some people say. So, there you go. So, I had an exchange with Leanna Kersner, who is a feminist, uh, cosplay, video game, geek, nerd culture enthusiast. And uh, I'm going to link that exchange in the low bar for anyone who, uh, any of you losers out there who really love to read my long comments. Um, but the conversation was about how there was some big, huge beef between me and her and how she had uh, refused to uh, come on to uh, Honey Badger Radio for a fireside chat or something because I had said some nasty things about her in the past and was refusing to apologize. Now, in my initial comment, which was not directed at Liana, but uh, was a, I was attempting to explain my position to people who were discussing this, I mentioned an appearance that she did on Rebel Media on Lauren Southern's old show, Standoff, and some errors that she had made on that show. And I did that as an example of the kinds of things that she said that I take issue with um, and why I would take issue with them and uh, and why I, I generally don't like her content. Um, I wanted to basically make it clear that my criticisms of her are not about personal grudges or, you know, uh, in my words, her nails on chalkboard delivery, um, or even about her self-identifying as feminist, but about where I think she gets it wrong. Now, she seemed really annoyed that I used as an example of, of my, I guess, my beef with her, something that was behind a paywall. Uh, she felt that this uh, gave me carte blanche to misrepresent her position because not everyone is able to go and check. Not everybody is willing to pay the eight bucks a month or something to be able to go and get access to that show. And uh, that's fair enough. I agree. And uh, I really do and have, since that show aired, um, really wanted to address some of the things that she said there. And uh, I addressed them in the comments of the video um, in several very long detailed comments because that's just who I am. Um, but of course, those are also behind a paywall. I just want to make it clear before we start, I don't have some kind of personal grudge against Liana. Um, and I, I conceded that I wasn't surprised she found that one specific comment I'd made about her, um, which someone was kind enough to uh, link to a screen cap of it that she would find that objectionable and hurtful. Um, I complimented what she had said in the video that I was commenting on, um, even allowing that I didn't agree with everything she'd said. Um, and I upvoted the video because she had, in as much as she could, um, been fair and charitable to both sides of, you know, a commentary on the Sargon and Anita um, VidCon debacle. Right? She approached it from a position of believing both sides right, and taking both sides at their word and then giving her opinion on who she felt was um, in the wrong or how she felt they were maybe both in the wrong um, or both uh, had behaved foolishly or, or whatever. Right? And I, I just I generally thought that it was, a, it was a really good breakdown coming from the premise that both parties are being honest. But since Liana suggested that I might be taking things uh, she'd said on Lauren's show out of context, I decided to jump through some hoops and get a crappy copy of it so I could critique it. Now, <clears throat> I appeared on this show uh, in the first half, um, and then she was on the show in the second half in studio with Lauren. The, um, the quality of the video and the sound is going to be poor um, because of how I had to, you know, extract it from the internet. Um, and not all of my comments are going to be critical. Um, some will be 
reasonably complimentary and uh, and I will be pausing uh, fairly frequently to add comment so that I can stay on the proper side of fair use and uh, and the video won't get taken down. So without further ado, let's get stuck into it. Welcome back. I have Leanna Kersner here with me in studio to discuss the issue of sexual assault in Canada further. She has promised me that her crazy feminist <laughs> urine throwing days are over and that I'd be safe to have her come sit down with me. So thank you so much, Leanna, for coming on the show and not bringing urine with you. Okay, first compliment. Leanna did not bring pee. Okay, I, I'm being silly, but I do want to commend her for being willing to go on Lauren's show. And in order to avoid any fair use algorithm thing, um, I, I'm just going to have to comment frequently. Well, I deliberately were white so the urine would stain. Oh. So, like, you know, if it got on you, get on me too. Well, and... I wear black, so I'm Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just in case of urine, wear black. Of course. Girls talk in fashion to break the ice. What is the appropriate attire for a date with a bottle of pee? <laughs> so, you, I, I was shocked when I went on Twitter and I asked if a feminist would come on the show. Yeah. Everyone was laughing. I got a bunch of retweets and they were like, Lauren, you're never going to get a feminist to come on your show. They just won't do that. And I actually got a reply from you and I was shocked. I was like, wow, someone who actually wants to come on and discuss this issue with someone who disagrees with them. So, I, I consider you a pretty sane feminist. So far, so good. L Liana is pretty sane as far as feminists go. But she is still a feminist, and she's still going to be looking at certain things through a certain lens. So, we shall see. What do you think of the whole kind of crazy people ripping out, open their shirts with hashtag believe women that are protesting outside uh, the courthouses at the Gomeshi trial? What are, what are your thoughts on their reaction to this issue? Well, First Amendment rights. Okay, I'm going to be pedantic here and say that we don't have the First Amendment here in Canada. Uh, that's a U.S. thing, but um, we do have free speech in Canada, kind of, sort of, uh, with a few more limits placed on it than in the U.S. So they have the right to do that. Of course. Right? As long as they're not breaking the law, they have the right to expose anything they want. I am big on exposure. The people they know, I'm good. I'm, like, shirt, no shirt, fine. Inside the courtroom, I think Marina, Maria Hannon uh, said it the best. Uh, I believe survivors is not, or I believe victims is not a legal principle. Yes, I believe survivors is not a legal principle yet. What Hennon said was that it can never be a legal principle. That's where she's fundamentally wrong. And I mean, Marie Hennon, she is fundamentally wrong. It should never be a legal principle, but it has been one and it can be made so again. All you have to do is change the laws, repeal the Magna Carta, and a bunch of other stuff, and it absolutely can become a legal principle and a foundation of our legal system. And uh, as I will explain later in the video, we are indeed moving in that direction. And we have to keep that in mind when we have these discussions of things, is a single acquittal does not really change the paradigm of the discussion of sexual assault. It can be a great case study to examine our theories and just sort of test principles. Okay, and here's where almost everyone uh, got it wrong with the Gomeshi case. Yes, you can use a given acquittal as a case study as to what went wrong, but the Gomeshi case is a case where everything went right. A conviction in this particular case would have been a miscarriage of justice, and I'm going to flesh that out more as we go further. But, um, and please forgive the mixing of metaphors, if activists were looking for a case of injustice to deny, justice denied, to hang their hats on, they're barking up the wrong hat rack. But what people have to remember about any crime, and especially crimes that really lack in physical evidence like this one, uh -huh. is the burden of proof for the legal system is here. The, the place where most of these situations, most of these bad acts inhabit, is somewhere below that. I agree. In most cases of sexual assault these days, uh, the, the thing occurs, the act occurs in circumstances where it would not be outlandish to believe that there was consent. You know, picture a jogging trail in a park, as I have said before, and a woman grabbed and beaten and raped in the bushes at 5 a.m. The assumption uh, on the part of the judge and the jury is going to be no woman would ever consent to sex under those circumstances. 
very, very easy to determine that there was no consent there because the assumption is going to be that there is no consent there. Now think about a date or a frat party or an acquaintance or a spouse. It's a lot harder to say that no woman would ever consent to sex in those cases. And even in cases where there is physical evidence, like a rape kit, um, it's usually evidence of an act that is more often legal than not. Surely you can agree that you and pretty much everyone else in the world has had consensual sex more times in their lives than they've been raped. Sex is not automatically assumed to be a wrongful act in the same way, say, stabbing somebody is or beating them with a lead pipe. And there have been studies showing that there is virtually no difference in the forensic sense between the average rape kit and the test results for the average great evening, right? So essentially the physical evidence that you would get from a rape kit frequently looks no different um, than consensual sex. So yeah, the, the burden is going to uh, be higher than most uh, complainants can meet. This is at least in part a consequence of women's sexual liberation. Um, whereas, you know, a hundred, two hundred years ago, um, if a man was not a woman's husband, the assumption would be quite similar to, uh, to that woman on the jogging trail, that no woman would consent to sex under these conditions or under these circumstances. Um, Placing legal restrictions on a woman, woman's sexual history, is she a slut, isn't going to change that basic assumption that people have now. You know, the understanding that lots of women have consensual sex with dates or guys at frat parties or friends with benefits or men they barely know, and you can't just assume, based on the fact that she barely knows him, that she wasn't consenting. You are supposed to come from a position of making no assumptions about her consent. But that's a little different than assuming that she wouldn't. And I, I can say this myself as a, a survivor, and I, I hate that term because right. I would rather be defined by what I do and not, what, not what's done to me. Agreed. I actually prefer the term victim when used in its proper context, as in I was a victim of sexual assault, which I was ages ago. Now, do I still consider myself a victim? No. Hence the past tense. Do I consider myself a survivor? I suppose if what that means is I've moved past it and gotten on with my life. But the moment you move past it and get on with your life, the word survivor kind of becomes meaningless. It's like saying I survived lunch or I survived yesterday. And, of course, I don't like the way survivor is used to describe people who have overcome situations that don't actually involve a risk to one's life. Rape can involve that risk, um, but it doesn't have to to be uh, a rape. And as I said in my segment of the show, um, sexual, a sexual assault can be as nonviolent and non-life-threatening um, in the technical sense, sexual assault can be something like someone patting you on your bum without permission. But I had to navigate the court system because of a criminal harassment complaint. And um, the, the sort of gendered problems within the legal system hit me in an interesting way because my stalker was a woman. I'd be interested in hearing that story sometime. I know of a few cases uh, um, involving men where the stalker was a woman too, and I'm happy to share a couple of them if you like. And so when you go in, there's a separate line for domestic abuse and then everybody else. Well, yes, there's also a separate line for female offenders and male ones, as well as for female complainants and male ones. They're not officially separate lines, but they exist. And because this um, particular, you know, allegedly person, I know what happened, I was there, but it was treated very differently. And uh, there was, you know, a false complaint of sexual assaults, and, and this person ended up going to spend the night in jail, got, you know, put in the system, plea bargained, everything like that, because of a criminal mischief charge. That's our term in Canada for perjury. No, it's not. We actually do have a law for perjury here in Canada. And uh, with a couple of exceptions, 
quote, everyone commits perjury who, with intent to mislead, makes before a person who is authorized by law to permit it to be made before him a false statement under oath or solemn affirmation by affidavit, solemn declaration or deposition or orally, knowing that the statement is false. The maximum penalty for perjury is 14 years in prison, though it doesn't usually get you more than two. It's generally considered to be a more serious offense than criminal mischief, which generally attracts a lighter sentence, a fine or a month or two in jail. Now, perjury is somebody lying under oath, somebody lying, knowingly, intentionally lying, when they have sworn to tell the truth. This can be a lie to police or to the court or on a sworn affidavit or during a deposition. Criminal or public mischief only requires that the person knowingly and intentionally engaged, engaged in actions that wasted police time that with intent to mislead. So that can include lying under oath, or it could also include falsifying physical evidence or even pranking. Um, Perjury requires the intentional utterance of a false statement while under oath. But let's say I fell on the ice and banged up my face and then went on Twitter and posted a picture and said that I'd been jumped by feminists and beaten up. And then somebody else reported that in good faith to the police and then the police began an investigation. I didn't lie in any sworn statement. And if I don't lie in a sworn statement to police, I can't be charged with perjury. I could, however, be charged with criminal mischief. Now, there is an overlap between the statutes, such that perjury is usually also covered under criminal mischief, but criminal mischief doesn't always involve perjury. All poodles are dogs, not all dogs are poodles. Mm -hmm. Right. So I have, it's like you were saying before the break, you, you don't believe these false accusations are real until it happens to you. And this yeah. is the reality of our justice system is... I prefer to call it the legal system because to me, justice is something that Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman do. The legal system is about our laws and how to, and that doesn't mean it's a bad system. The criminal justice system is only part of the legal system. The legal system is a very broad thing and uh, as two primary parts uh, encompass civil torts and crimes. Now, a tort is a wrongful act by one individual against another that is actionable, and it is pursued in a civil court or court of equity. Um, in a tort, one party is suing the other, and if the plaintiff wins, the defendant might be required to pay damages or be ordered to do something or stop doing something. The burden is a preponderance of evidence and sometimes uh, clear and convincing evidence, depending on how serious the grievance is. Um, and that burden is quite low because torts involve a grievance by one party against another and because the penalties are, in relative terms, minor, you know, that compared to prison. Discovery goes both ways, uh, meaning both sides have to reveal to the other any evidence that they plan to be using at trial, and the defendant can almost always be compelled to testify. In fact, both plaintiff and defendant. Uh, there really is no excuse for either of them uh, to demand to not have to testify. Now, a crime is a wrongful act by an individual against society. Not against another individual, against society. The victim of the crime is not a party to the legal action against the accused. The plaintiff in a criminal case is the state, the people or the crown, not the person harmed. Because the government is prosecuting the case, on behalf of the people, with all of the collective resources of the state behind it, and because the penalties can involve not just fines or orders and injunctions, but the suspension of someone's right to freedom and autonomy, of a suspension of their rights under Canada's Charter of Rights and Freedoms, um, the burden on the plaintiff is higher. And uh, that's beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, so there's a reason most people don't call the criminal justice system the legal system um, because it's it's not. It's part of our legal system. It just means we have to recognize the limits of it. And just because a woman doesn't successfully, her testimony does not successfully lead to a conviction in a court of law doesn't mean there isn't 
justice that can be done. It doesn't mean she can't make something good out of it. Very true. On the other hand, just because a given woman's testimony doesn't lead to conviction doesn't mean that justice wasn't done in the courtroom, and vice versa. Now, I'm going to describe a case that uh, was before the Supreme Court of Canada back in, I think it was 2010, and it was called RVJA. Um, the facts of the case, as laid out in the Supreme Court's decision, were as follows. And these are, these are basically uh, findings of fact before the court, right? The court has agreed that this is what happened and made its decision based on these facts. So one evening, a couple of BDSM enthusiasts in a long-term relationship were having sex. The parties agreed on the activities in advance. At one point, and according to plan, the guy choked his female partner unconscious. During the time she was unconscious, about three minutes, he tied her up and inserted a sex toy in her bum. She came to, he untied her and removed the toy, and then they continued to have hot, sweaty, kinky sex for the rest of the evening. Now, some few months later, they got into an argument and began, uh, you know, shrieking end of the relationship kind of stuff at each other. The man threatened to seek custody of their young son. And if I recall, it was actually, the decision actually used the word threatened, which seems kind of strange, um, since why wouldn't a man want custody of his son? The woman went to police and reported that on the night in question, her partner had gone outside the scope of what she had agreed to while she was unconscious. That is, she had woken up and found a dildo up her bum that she hadn't bargained for. And so he was arrested, tried and convicted, and sentenced to, I think, two years in prison. Now, his lawyers managed to swing an appeal. During the appeal, it came out and became a fact before the court that the woman had lied in her initial complaint and at trial. Indeed, the man had not gone outside the scope of what the parties had agreed to. She had made the complaint uh, to prevent him from getting custody of their son. Now, the conviction was overturned and the man was released from prison, but in the decision of the appeal court, one of the judges posed a legal question, right? He wondered if there is a legal basis to the idea that one can consent in advance to sexual activities that will occur when they are unconscious. Is this a legally tenable concept, given the statutes, the definitions, and the case law? Because this guy asked this question, the case was then sent up to the Supreme Court of Canada to make a ruling on that question. The majority on the Supreme Court decided that consent given in advance to sexual acts that will occur while a person is unconscious has no legal validity. Consent is based on an ongoing, contemporaneous, conscious state of mind. So when state of mind goes away through unconsciousness, so does consent. They found that despite any agreement between the two parties, and despite the fact that at no time was the woman's state of mind not one of consent, once the woman fell unconscious, her consent to any sexual activity, even sexual activity she had requested, was legally vitiated. So the conviction was, uh, the the appeal decision was overturned, the conviction was upheld, and this guy went back to prison. Now, do you think, Liana, that justice was done in this case? I mean, the law was followed, but was justice done? A woman's testimony, despite it being maliciously false, ultimately resulted in a conviction despite the fact that she had perjured herself. It also resulted in a precedent that effectively criminalizes caressing your partner while they sleep, or waking them up with a kiss or a blowjob, even if they asked you to. And it seriously complicates things between kink enthusiasts as if their sex lives weren't complicated enough. Just for some perspective on how injustice can, uh, can happen all kinds of different ways in a courtroom. You know, I find that 
a very interesting answer because that already places you on a completely different realm for me in the world of the people arguing on this issue because most of the people that identify as feminists or just our default feminists mm -hmm. on this issue, you're seeing them and you're seeing the media popularize this opinion that what happened, what Marie Hanine did was so wrong, it was so evil, that this is just the worst thing that could have happened to but that's Canada, sexist. we need a whole change. That's sexist and she said it herself. Yes, she did. However, I would like to draw your attention to the growing number of male judges in Canada being dragged in front of inquiries for not being sensitive enough to rape complainants. Now, what she found sexist was that feminists and SJWs described her as a gender traitor, specifically for doing her job. If a male attorney had got up there and done his job, which is what she did, she did her job and she did it very, very well, I think what she did was very feminist. Again, I doubt that the press would have described a male defense attorney as a gender traitor or unfeminist, um, but I highly doubt he would be free from vilification in the media if he had done what Henan did in this particular high-profile case. He would instead be a privileged, misogynist male re-victimizing these victims and turning back the clock on women's rights to safety and bodily autonomy. He'd have been held up as an example, not of someone just doing his job to the best of his ability, but of the ongoing system of male patriarchal oppression of women. You know, don't think for a moment a man in Hennon's position wouldn't have been trashed in the press. They'd just be attacking him from a different angle. And yeah. unfortunately, she is an antagonistic archetype in because it's the legal system, and so people saw the complainants as the, the heroine of the story, they were Snow White, and she was the evil stepmother. That you can blame on the press, and on the advocates they chose to give a big old fat platform to, who spun this case so hard, I was almost shocked it didn't send the earth out of its orbit. They turned this case into a narrative, rather than reporting on it accurately and dispassionately, and social media certainly didn't help. The reporting itself was so shoddy, I can't begin to tell you the number of people I have come across who not only wholeheartedly believe that Gomeshi got away with it and got off on a technicality, but who believe that what he got away with was rape. And, I mean, the reality is it's very different. She was there doing her job. And if people felt... And I realized this after the fact, after I've the tweet of, oh my god, how does she have no soul? I mean, guilty, right? Guilty as charged, right here. How does she have no soul? Did it ever once occur to you that maybe Gomeshi didn't do what he was accused of? And if it never did, what does that say about your soul? But that was what the reporting coming out on Twitter was calibrated to make me feel, right? right. And I realized after the facts, like, wait a minute, what we didn't see on Twitter because of the nature of Twitter was the prosecutor sitting there, like the Crown sitting there, not objecting to that line of questioning. It was their job to jump in and stop that. And here's where I know you either really didn't follow the trial itself or you don't understand how the law works. And this is what actually sort of got me listening harder. When I heard this, it got me paying closer attention to everything that you were saying. Examination of the behavior of the complainants toward Gameshi after the alleged assaults was admissible because it was introduced by the Crown or by the complainants. It was the Crown that entered this into evidence. It was the Crown who asked, and what did you do after he assaulted you? And the complainants answered, I did X. What X was, in this case, for all the complainants was, I avoided any further contact with him. In Ducatere's case, she claimed that she stayed for the rest of the weekend so as not to make waves, but kept her distance for that whole time, and that from that point onward, she didn't want any contact with him and avoided any communication with him unless it was required for her work. Now, the moment that the Crown and its witnesses raised those issues in their testimony, the truth or untruth of them, of those things that they were claiming became a matter of interest before the court and was now fair game for the defense. So the Crown did not object because the Crown had no grounds upon which to object 
to Hennon's cross-examination <clears throat> or her presentation of counter-evidence because the Crown was the party that had opened that line of questioning. Once you do that, it is now open to cross-examination. To the complainants were their own worst enemy. Had they had the Crown known about all of this exculpatory evidence, they would never have, o have opened that line of inquiry. In fact, had the Crown known that the complainants did not avoid any further contact with Gomeshi, and had she, knowing this, allowed them to testify that they had avoided him, she would have been guilty of support, suborning perjury. So, this is how things went down. The Crown says, what did you do after he assaulted you? Complainant answers, I did X. Defense says, well, I have evidence here in my hand that you didn't do X, you actually did Y and Z. And the only way to have avoided this situation was for the Crown to never have asked the question. The only way the Crown would have known not to ask is if the complainants had been honest with their in their statements to police and to the prosecutor. So what you seem to be arguing for here is that the Crown should have been able to, to introduce evidence, you know, testimony is evidence, and then successfully be able to object to the defense testing that evidence. If, if that were the way the criminal court worked, I bet the Crown would have a conviction rate of 100%. The prosecutor was supposed to be, uh, well, in the U.S., it's, a, it's an advocate because they have complainant, you know, it's a more, it's a more adversarial system. Uh -huh. No, the system in the U.S. is not substantially more adversarial than it is in Canada. Up here, the idea is that it's the Crown in our, in our very awesome steampunky type terms, right, in our legal system, the crown is the complainant. In Canada, the people's representative is the crown, therefore the crown is the complainant. In the U.S., the complainant is the people, or the people of the state of New York, or whatever. The alleged victim, as I said above, just like in Canada, is not a party to a criminal case. And these uh, these women coming forward to, to tell their, their stories, their version of events, the Crown does not represent them. Neither does the DA or the DA's office in the criminal system in the U.S. They are, it's much, it's so, there is no advocate for these women in the courtroom. And that's because they're not children. Children are allowed to have advocates in the court to act on their behalf within certain limits when they're testifying as witnesses. Of course, this advocate is not legally representing the child the way an attorney would be, because the child is not a party to the proceeding and therefore is not entitled to an attorney. But the advocate is there, for instance, to explain to the court that uh, a given child witness isn't old enough to say, understand the meaning or import of the oath to... Uh, swear to tell the truth and needs a modified one. <clears throat> of course, <clears throat> given the things the Gomeshi complainants said, while under oath perhaps they could have used an advocate like that explaining to them exactly what swearing that oath meant. And so that's an issue because yes, they had their own lawyers, but those lawyers were not a, a party in that case. Mm -hmm. Oh, because the complainants were not a party in this case. If they wanted to be a party in a case, they could have sued Gomeshi in a civil court. So unlike what we see on TV... On TV, like uh, when it shows the bailiff reading off the docket, the people of the state of Georgia versus Finnegan. You mean like those TV shows? I mean, TV, TV shows do take a lot of liberties and are well known for bending reality because reality is really boring. But I don't know that I have ever seen an American TV show dealing with criminal trials that opened with the bailiff reading out Decouter et al. versus Gomeshi. You know, and Lauder and a special victims unit. We're injection, your honor, and no, and, and you see the, the hugging and the care. The hugging and the care and, and the coaching and the witness prep. You know, like, that's actually not allowed. The prosecutor is expected to keep a very, very respectful distance from the complainants and their other prosecution witnesses. I mean, it's a violation of ethical guidelines to be too close 
um, to your witnesses as a prosecutor, and it can actually actually result in the crown prosecutor being forced into the role of witness in a given case. That is, if they share too much back and forth with their witnesses, they may be called to the stand to testify as to that. And that's no place any prosecutor wants to be. Now, the huggy, hands-on approach you sometimes see on TV is a potential one-way ticket to a stay of proceedings because it's unethical. The prosecutor is given a case by police and the prosecutor is supposed to minimize any time spent with any of the witnesses so as not to taint their testimony. And it would be a gross conflict of interest since the prosecutor's client is not the complainant. It is the public. And they are supposed to be acting in the public interest, not the interest of the complainant, which may be in direct contradiction to the public interest at times. The prosecutor owes no obligation whatsoever to the complainant. And indeed, if the prosecutor knows the complainant is lying, they are required to disclose this as long as as doing so is in the public interest, the interest of the prosecutor's client, and not doing so is against the interest of the prosecutor's client. I also, as an aside, have to wonder just how much that prosecutor felt like hugging those complainants after they'd completely demolished the case and embarrassed the fuck out of her. The Crown is not an advocate for the complainant. And it never should be. It never should be. Not in a criminal case. And again, neither is the DA in a criminal case in the United States. If the complainant wants an advocate, they have every option to pursue their redress of grievance in a civil court at their own expense and without the broad powers and massive resources of the state in their pocket. Well, a lot of people would have argued that the Crown didn't have the the ability to interject and put a counterpoint to this line of question because... uh, the Crown didn't know about it. These girls had, quite frankly, lied on the stand. They had lied to the police or or withheld information from both the police, the Crown, their lawyers, that, yes, they did contact Gomeshi later. Yes, they did have these emails with him where they said they enjoyed the events that took place. Mm -hmm. If the prosecutor had known, I doubt the case would have made it into a courtroom at all. It's not in the public interest to prosecute a case that has zero chance of conviction, and it's certainly not in the public interest to wrongfully convict somebody. And the Crown and their lawyers were blindsided by this, so I don't know if it's necessarily a complete failure on the Crown's part. Well, I... Okay, and you're about to go off the rails here. I'll grant you, you're not ripping your shirt open and screaming, Go Meshi guilty! while tearing apart the studio. But just because you're speaking calmly and in a reasonable tone doesn't mean what you're about to say here is legitimate. It depends on who you ask. And I've asked a lot of legal professionals, a lot of experts in this right. case. I'm not a lawyer. Right. So I, I don't want to you know, talk out of turn on Canadian law. But this is where the presumption of innocence is such a fundamentally critical principle. It is. Presumption of innocence is the bedrock of our criminal justice process, and without it, we are at the mercy of the state any time it chooses, for any reason or no reason at all, to single someone out and lock them in a cage. To the, the Canadian system is that we tend, as people, to presume guilt. That's not why. I mean, it's a reason why it's important and why it works so well, But it's not the reason presumption of innocence exists. Civil cases can be tried by juries and judges, are subject to human biases despite their best efforts to set them aside, and yet there is no presumption of innocence in a civil trial, at least not in the way we would ever understand it in criminal proceedings. Presumption of innocence is not there to counter human biases, not even biases of judges and juries, let alone the public and the press. It's there to prevent the state from having carte blanche to drag you out of your home in the middle of the night on false or specious charges, demand that you prove you didn't commit whatever the state is accusing you of, and then lock you away when you fail. It's there to prevent the state from becoming an agent of oppression. Right. He was accused, he did it. She was inconsistent, therefore she's lying. The presumption of innocence is designed to short-circuit that human conditioning. Again, no. 
It's to prevent our government from being able to do to us what some other governments sometimes do to their citizens. Where we can't just assume that because there's an accusation, that there's a crime. We can't just assume that because somebody may very well have forgot while well, their mind is reeling that they, they sent an email that was later very incriminating and, and very, you know, uh, not counterproductive. Presumption of innocence does not apply to complainants, and it should not. Absolutely should not. Presumption of, oops, I just forgot, also does not apply to complainants. The Fifth Amendment, not sure what it is called in Canada, but, you know, the, uh, the exemption from testifying and, and incriminating oneself, that does not apply to complainants. This is for a very simple reason. The complainant is petitioning the state to remove a human being from his life and forcibly restrain and confine him with the full legitimating ap approval of the people. The defendant is petitioning the state to leave him alone. It is the complainant that is asking the court to commit things that if a private citizen did them would amount to multiple felonies. If I grabbed someone out of their home and locked them away in a cage for years, I would be guilty of kidnapping and, and assault and battery and illegal restraint and, and forcible, illegal forcible confinement, right? But the court, the court has a right to do this to people with the support and the approval of the people. But first it must prove to the people that its actions are justified and are therefore not criminal. Because if they do not have just cause to do this, their actions are criminal. The person who is petitioning the court to essentially destroy another person's life on their behalf does not and cannot enjoy the same presumption of innocence as the person they are asking the court to destroy. The reason for this is because the power of the court to destroy lives capriciously and unjustly is much greater than the power of any individual to do so, and because the court is obligated to act in the interest of the people, not in the interests of complainants. This is why we place limits on the court when it comes to ruining people's lives. And as for your whole, oh, I forgot, I sent an email. Were you even paying attention? Dicuter forgot she sent emails and handwritten love letters and flowers and more emails and even more emails and risque, risque photos for a year or more, aggressively pursuing a romantic relationship with Gomeshi, demanding that he hang with her, and even hinting at marriage. That's a lot of shit to forget. One of the other complainants somehow forgot she even went on a subsequent date with Gomeshi after she, he allegedly assaulted her and gave him a hand job. Well, she forgot it right up until she heard that the other two complainants were ripped apart on the stand over the things that they forgot. And another complainant somehow forgot that the car she insisted she was assaulted in could not have been the one Gomeshi owned at the time because an entirely it but was an entirely different car that he had purchased seven months later. She somehow didn't just forget the car he was driving. She imagined or made up an entirely different car he didn't even own at the time. And, and it's ridiculous because she claimed that the car itself was material to her memory of the event. De Couture also forgot that she had discussed the case extensively with one of the other complainants prior to the trial. She forgot so completely that she managed to forget hundreds of texts she'd sent and received in exchange with this other complainant in lengthy online conversations between the time they made their statements to police and the trial. So much forgetting going on here. You know, and given that Ducatere clearly testified that after the alleged assault, she kept her distance from him for the remainder of the weekend and then avoided any further contact with him, and yet the day after the alleged assault, photos were taken of them together with her arms draped around him, gazing adoringly up at him. Within days, she'd sent him flowers and a handwritten love letter signed, I love your hands. 
And then email after email after text after email demonstrating a pattern of romantic pursuit of Gomeshi over the course of the next year, and also a pattern of exquisitely polite brush-offs on his part. Now, that's not forgetting, right? Saying nothing, saying I didn't do anything might be forgetting, but making sh shit up about what you did, right? that doesn't resemble any of what you actually did, that's lying. Not only does she not remember this stuff, she testified to the exact opposite. She didn't just forget what she did. She invented other shit she claimed she did. And maybe, just maybe, she is crazy enough to have convinced herself that what she testified to initially was the actual real truth. Maybe she's so crazy... She made shit up in her head, convinced herself it was real, and wasn't testifying to things that she knew were false. But, you know, I don't think it's a good idea to convict someone based on testimony that you know is erroneous or false coming from either a liar or a lunatic. And yes, I'm focusing heavily on Decouter here for reasons I hope will become apparent further on will say both are possible you know occam's razor I mean, both, both are possible yeah. but it's, it's yeah. a little unlikely that three people forgot it it's yeah, also it's... unlikely that all three are lying i mean this is a classic example of statistics and 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 the facts of this case being completely at odds with each other right like statistically it is very very unlikely that all three women were lying even if you take the highest statistic floated by men's rights activists that 41 to 45% of women lie on the stand. There were three of them. This is a new one. A feminist prioritizing pure math over feelings and intuition. But, unfortunately, Liana, it is a bogus argument in this case. I mean, it completely erases the role of human psychology uh, and group psychology, bandwagoning, you know, stuff like that. In reality, there are cases where many complaints do mean that an accusation is more credible because there is corroboration from other victims. But sometimes this actually works in the opposite direction. Sometimes we have situations with dozens or even hundreds of declared victims, all of whose claims turned out to be totally spurious. The odds of three random women all falsely reporting to police that they've been victimized by the same person, none of whom have any knowledge of the other's existence, and when there is no media coverage of it beforehand, those odds are, as you say, astronomical. But this case wasn't that. This case involved allegations published in the press long before any of the complainants ever went to police, Decoter herself did several media interviews before she even filed a police report. The initial allegations relating to Decoter, um, I believe, uh, were published by a journalist called Jesse Brown, who is a longtime friend of the fourth complainant, which I will not get to here, maybe, unless, it, uh, unless I have to split this into two videos because it's so long. Um, and he has a bad history with Gomeshi and with the CBC. The press and the police then began begging other women to come forward with their stories of how Gomeshi had assaulted them. And somehow, all the complainants seemed to feel it more, more appropriate to talk to the press before actually talking to police. Not only that, at least two of them, uh, Lucie de Couter and one of the others, uh, felt it uh, a good idea to talk to each other before talking to police. Now, partway through the whole brouhaha, de Couture waived her right to a publication ban on her name so that she could, in her own words, become for sexual assault victims what David Beckham is to Armani underwear. Um, she wanted to be a poster child, and certainly her public profile was elevated quite significantly, um, such that she actually had to hire a publicist. Now, there are all kinds of cases where high-profile figures attract false allegations, and uh, they are going to be more likely to attract them because they are public figures, or where highly publicized allegations cause a surge of copycat allegations. Now, pretending that human psychology and behavior can be boiled down to a uh, mathematical function 
as if humans all exist in a vacuum and behave like robots is silly. Pretending that mentally disturbed women wouldn't be attracted to a case like this and maybe exaggerate or fabricate claims, that's also very naive. It's as silly as insisting that the rate of false accusations in Salem was exactly the same in 1692 as it was in 1691. Because, you know, the odds of multiple women lying about something, those odds are astronomical. And even if the complainants were not intentionally lying, key portions of their testimony, portions that they themselves said were important and material to what happened to them, were found to be false or in error. Um, for instance, the complainant who claimed she was assaulted in Gomeshi's yellow VW Beetle, um, that car was, by her own testimony, really important to what happened to her. She testified that she was unsure of whether it would be safe to go on a date with a guy like him, but then she convinced herself that it would be because she thought a potentially dangerous man simply wouldn't drive a yellow VW Beetle. She found the car charming. It, it disarmed her and it put her off guard and that's why she got in to the car with him because he was driving this yellow VW Beetle. Um, at which point he then assaulted her in the yellow VW Beetle, allegedly. Um, a yellow VW Beetle he didn't own until seven months after he allegedly assaulted her in it. Now, how can you argue that a man should be convicted based on that? Based on that. Another of the complainants brought a character witness, a close friend of hers, who went on to testify that the complainant was romantically obsessed with Gomeshi, despite Gomeshi having shown no romantic interest in her whatsoever. The complainant testified that she was separated from her husband at the time the alleged assault took place, when in fact she was not. Uh, she testified that Gomeshi was instantly smitten with her. Her own word, smitten. Yet her own character witness who had helped, who, you know, had even helped her set up a situation in which the complainant would find herself conveniently alone with Gomeshi, testified that she'd advised the complainant that he just didn't seem that into her and she should just give up on her romantic aspirations. Now, all of this is in the trial transcripts. And you might be asking yourself now, uh, having heard some of it, why this shit wasn't really much reported on in the media or on Twitter, or at least in media sources that most feminists would be interested in reading. You think maybe this stuff might be detrimental to the narrative that was being pushed by the press and the victim advocates? You know, that the complainants were, as you put it, Snow White, and Gomeshi was a monster, and Henan was an evil stepmother gender traitor. Now, I'm going to give you lots of credit for going on Lauren's show, right? I think that that was a good thing you did, and I would like to see more feminists do stuff like that. But I really wish you'd have educated yourself more about the facts of the case before speaking to them on, on television, rather than going by the media narrative that you yourself, just a few minutes ago, uh, said was unreliable. So, you know, even if well, two the, of them lie, the number of liars you. doesn't uh, necessarily, well, but the number like, of individuals doesn't but necessarily this is make the it more thing. or less. Yeah, but common sense is neither, right? You have to be very careful and examine the facts, and this is why we have a burden of proof. Because statistically, at least one of those women was telling the truth. Okay, that's not even how, like, straight probability works. You know, example, when you flip a coin, you have a 50-50 chance that the toss will turn up heads. So let's say I flip the coin... 10 times. And every single time, uh, for the last 10 times, it came up heads. What are the odds that the next flip, it'll come up heads? Well, that flip has the same 50-50 chance as the previous 10 flips. The odds of the totality of it, 11 flips coming up heads, those are indeed small, but the odds of any given flip turning up heads is still going to be 50%. Now, Let's consider that the coins I'm flipping here are sentient individuals with their own internal motivations and that the coins themselves are self-selecting. That is, I haven't cho chosen the coins at random, but rather the coins have put themselves forward and asked to be flipped, and on top of that, the coins can control how they land, and the coins have been talking to each other. Not so easy now, is it? It's not so much a matter of statistical probabilities anymore.
But courts don't work on statistics. Court works on who makes the better argument. You're right that the court does not work on statistics, thank God. But you're wrong that the court works on who makes the better argument. Court, especially criminal court, is not so much about rhetoric. It's about evidence and burden of proof. Um, one of the most interesting things I've seen recently was a bit of the transcript in a sexual assault case adjudicated by Alberta Judge Robin Camp. This is the very case that landed Camp in a giant vat of hot water because of a question he asked the complainant that was deemed by feminists to be insensitive and evidence that he bought into rape myths. Of course, in the press, this particular question, this little snippet of the transcript was entirely isolated from the surrounding context, uh, which made it sound like he was saying something that he actually wasn't in this case. Um, but that's neither here nor there. Camp had made it clear that he was not experienced in sexual assault law um, and ad adjudicating sexual assault cases. And this is actually really significant because the rules in sexual assault cases are quite dissimilar from those in other types of criminal trials um, because of the rape shield uh, legislation and things like that. So the prosecutor in this case kindly offered to keep him up to speed and advise him um, if and when he might need advising in terms of what the law actually says. Now, this case was not just he said, she said. There were other witnesses whose testimony supported the defendant's version of events and uh, contradicted the complainants, and the judge ended up acquitting him. And incidentally, the prosecution won the right to an appeal based mostly on that single unfortunate question during direct examination taken completely out of context and uh, all of the ensuing spin the media put on it. So it wasn't just the judge in hot water and facing an inquiry. The defendant was found himself on trial again, and uh, he was thank thankfully eventually acquitted a second time based on the merits of the case. Now, all of that aside, what I found most interesting in the transcript was when the prosecutor advised the judge that reasonable doubt was insufficient reason to acquit the accused. Like, I, I'm serious. She said this to the judge after offering to advise him on the proper way to adjudicate the case. She advised him that not only was the fact that he had reasonable doubt of the complainant's version of events enough cause to acquit, but that him finding the defendant's version of events more credible than the complainant's was still not enough reason to justify an acquittal. She actually told him that he had to be certain that the defendant's version of events was credible and the complainant's was false. She had to believe the defendant and disbelieve the complainant in order to justify acquitting the guy. Now you let that sink in. Because that is about presumption of innocence and reasonable doubt. This is a prosecutor, an officer of the court, it's on the record. It's in the transcripts. She is improperly advising the judge, a judge who is relying on her because he has no experience with sexual assault cases, that not only is reasonable doubt insufficient to acquit, but that the burden of proof is on the defendant to convince the judge of his innocence. Now, what she essentially said is what you've said here. She essentially told him that it boils down to who has the better argument. And then when he said he thought the defendant did, she told him that even that wasn't enough. He had to be fully convinced by that better argument. She put the entire burden that it usually falls on the prosecution onto the defense and told the judge that was the way things work. That he had to be convinced that the defendant's argument was infallible and unassailable compared to the complainant's. And I'm sorry, but that's not how the criminal court works. In fact, in a criminal court, the defense doesn't even have to make any arguments, let alone credible ones. The burden is entirely on the prosecution to prove that their argument is not only better, not only more likely to be true than some other version of events, but that it is, in fact, the true version of events beyond a reasonable doubt. 
The prosecutor in this case then advised the judge that the burden of proof in sexual assault cases is the reverse of what it normally is, and it's the judge in this case who is in trouble, not the prosecutor. And in this case, Marie Hennon made a better argument. I don't really know that Marie Hennon actually came out and explicitly said that, um, that, uh, this, this is what really is happening here. But what she did um, was sit and listen to the complainants give false and or erroneous testimony during direct and then introduce evidence on cross, demonstrating that a ton of what they had said on the stand under oath was simply not true. For whatever reason. The prosecution's case didn't involve physical evidence. There were no tissue, tissue samples, no CCTV footage, no DNA evidence or pubic hair or corroborating witnesses. Nothing. Right? All there was was the testimony of the complainants. All Marie Hennon had to do was undermine their credibility. And wouldn't you know it? She had physical evidence that did exactly that. A mountain of physical evidence that directly contradicted what the claimants had testified to. She didn't have to make a better argument. All she had to do was expose the fact that the complainants could not be trusted to tell the truth. Whether their testimony was intentionally false or merely in error on a whole bunch of things, either way, it was not reliable. To, to It could not be trusted as a basis to convict a man and deprive him of his liberty. Period. No, you're, you're approaching this very logically. It sounds very reasonable to say that in a criminal court it comes down to who makes the better argument because most people don't know how, to, how the criminal court works or is supposed to work. And yes, sometimes it does come down to which side makes the better argument. But the reality is that there is no onus on the defense to present any argument whatsoever. All they have to do is find a single flaw in the prosecution's argument that casts a reasonable doubt on it and the court is then obliged to acquit which is surprising for me because you do identify as a feminist. How do you feel about the mainstream? Because mainstream feminism does not approach things like this. They approach it based on feelings, how it makes them feel. And this, uh, how these women felt victimized. The people who were protesting felt angry. The changes that they're asking for the court system are feel better for alleged victims, uh, make them feel better, make them feel not re-victimized. You're approaching this very logically. Now, Lauren's wrong here. You're not approaching this logically. You are approaching it mostly dispassionately, which is commendable, but there's a difference between being calm and well-spoken and speaking logically and knowledgeably on a topic. And you're miles above most feminists, I know, but you still manage to get a whole lot of stuff wrong. How do you feel about the rest of your community that is kind of basing a lot of their arguments on feelings? Well, based on my own ethics on the subject, my feelings don't really matter. My, well, they, my that's opinions not, matter, but I, I will agree. answer the question. <laughs> um, on matters of criminal law, what neither feelings nor opinions should matter. Only what can or cannot be proven beyond a reasonable doubt matters. If the Crown can meet that burden, there's a conviction. If the Crown cannot, the only option is to acquit. Even if you believe in your heart of hearts, the guy is guilty. Even if the prosecutor and complainants charm your pants off, and the defendant picks his nose in public, stammers, and keyed your car last week. That's how this is supposed to work. Now, does it work perfectly? Not by a long shot. People have biases, and everyone involved in a trial is a person, from the people giving testimony, to the attorneys examining them, to the experts assessing the physical evidence, to the judge and the jury. But it's the best thing we've got. And the prosecution is great at rhetoric and could sell a freezer to an Eskimo is not a legally valid reason to convict someone and send them to prison. A lot of people who identify as feminists, they, they are, but that's their version of feminism, right? And what feminism has told me uh, as a particular kind of feminist, because you have to remember there's a lot of different types of feminists, just like there's a lot of different types of any massive group, any civil rights. Right, right. We, but usually people judge based on the majority and what they see popularized in the media, the leaders of the movement, individuals like Anita Sarkeesian, individuals... Uh, Everybody at home right now is going, oh, because <laughs> uh, I have history with the followers of Anita Sarkeesian. And she has a way bigger platform than you do, Liana, and that's a shame. Because as feminists go, you're about as good as it gets. 
But I want to tell you what's happened since the Gomeshi, Gomeshi case in Canada. Justin Trudeau is bringing in legislative amendments that, according to the Toronto Star, would do the following. The amendments would clarify that sexting, texts, emails, photos, or videos of a sexual nature or for a sexual purpose from before or after an alleged assault could not be used against a complainant and instead would be put to the same legal test known as the Rape Shield Law. Under Rape Shield provisions now, a complainant's private medical records are not admissible in a trial unless the accused can prove that they are key to disproving the allegations and vital to his constitutional right to a fair trial. Such material cannot, however, be used to support a defendant's claim that the complainant is blameworthy, more likely to have consented to sexual activity, or is less worthy of belief, the so-called twin myths in rape cases. Now, you need to pay attention here. The proposed changes would add personal emails or communications, as well as other kinds of personal records like personal diaries or counseling advice, to the list of inadmissible records. Now, let's say a woman texts her fuck buddy and says, come over and let's do it. She asks him to film them having sex, and he does. Then afterwards, she sends him several texts and emails thanking him for the great time and saying, let's do that again. Then she writes in her diary how she seduced him and was super happy with the outcome. All of that evidence Texts, emails, video, diary, that would now be subject to rape shield laws. A defendant would have to fight. He would have to convince a judge to allow them to be entered into evidence. And the defendant's use of that evidence would be extremely limited. He could not use it as evidence that she was more likely to have consented than not, or to discredit her, to make her seem to be uh, less belief-worthy, right, than the defendant. I've read some amazing things about rape shield laws. One analysis of the changes made over the last 40 years included a very interesting case. This was back in the, I believe, 1980s. The complainant was a young, single, white woman the defendant was a black man, and the only piece of physical evidence tying this man to this alleged crime was a pubic hair from a black man found on the complainant's cervix. Now, you got to understand, um, this was in the U.S. It was when interracial dating was still rare, shacking up was not really going on too, too much, and DNA evidence didn't exist, right? So this is going to inform the ability of a jury to decide the relevance of this black pubic hair and uh, they're going to have all kinds of assumptions as to um, what they can assume to be the truth uh, when the, the, wit the complainant testifies. So anyway, on the stand, the complainant testified to a number of things. Among them, she claimed that when the rape occurred, she was not dating anyone was not sexually active, and that she had been uh, that time at that time living at home with her mother. Now, this would all seem to be very, very believable in the context of 1980s U U.S. You know, people would be like, "Well, that makes perfect sense. Uh, this is totally believable." So it's like saying you had spaghetti for lunch. Anyway, in reality. When the rape occurred, this woman was living in sin with her black boyfriend. Everyone but the jury was made aware of this, but the judge ruled that evidence challenging her testimony and incidentally providing an alternate and highly plausible explanation for the physical evidence that the entire case rested on would be disallowed because it involved her sexual history, and a complainant's sexual history is protected by rape shield laws. You know, never mind that it provided that alternate explanation as to how a pubic hair from a black man might have actually found its way onto her cervix, in a case where the prosecution's entire case was resting on the fact that the only way that could have happened is that the defendant raped the complainant. Her perjury, her perjury, was allowed to stand 
as truth before the jury because of rape shield laws. And that was in the 1980s. I'm pretty sure the system hasn't gotten more hostile to complainants <clears throat> since then. So do you think Marie Hennon would have been allowed to enter into evidence the love letters, the sexts, the risque photos, the romantic emails, the flowers, right? The photos, if they fell under rape shield laws, if they were not allowed to be used to demonstrate likelihood of consent or to undermine the credibility of the complainants because they comprise part of the accuser's sexual history. I mean, let me put it this way. The judge in the Gomeshi trial said in his judgment that he didn't base his decision on an assumption that the texts and emails and flowers and handwritten love letters were evidence that the complainants had consented. He did not because he could not, given what he knows about how after an assault, victims sometimes behave in counterintuitive ways. He said, and I'm paraphrasing, but bear with me, it's entirely possible for a woman to be violently sexually assaulted by a man to be traumatized by it and then spend the next year or more doing everything in her power to hook up with him again. Nothing in the complainant's behavior after the alleged assault says one thing about whether the assault actually took place, nor even does the fact that their testimony does not match the physical evidence. Even that doesn't mean that they weren't assaulted. Genuine victims might do all manner of crazy things, he said, including seeking further contact with their assailants, repressing memories of events, or even lying in court. And none of these can be seen as evidence that the assaults did not take place. So, his entire decision was based on the fact that the complainant's testimony was unreliable. His entire justification was that it would be unjust to send a man to prison based solely on testimony that could not be trusted because so much of it had been contradicted by the physical evidence. So even if a judge did allow Marie Hennon to enter those exhibits into evidence, this law would have forced her to show all of it to the prosecution and the complainants at the outset in a closed hearing to decide whether it would be admitted de Couture and the other complainants would have been made aware of the fact that Gomeshi had saved all of the emails, texts, and love letters right at the start of the trial and been allowed to review them, giving them the opportunity to alter the stories they planned to tell on the stand to conform to the evidence. And Judge Horkins came right out and said in his decision that none of the complainants' behavior, the repeated communications, romantic overtures, etc., could be considered evidence that they were not assaulted. So, Gomeshi would have been convicted. On top of it all, this bill would codify affirmative consent with the express purpose of making it so that, quote, someone accused of sexual assault could not claim the mistaken belief that the victim consented to sex. Do you know what a strict liability offense is? Imagine if you were driving a car, paying attention, following the rules of the road and the posted speed limit, and a kid darted out from between parked cars and you were unable to stop in time. An accident, right? You had no intent under any legal definition of intent, you know, malice, recklessness, negligence, depraved indifference, right? Yet, under a strict liability system, you would still be considered guilty of first-degree murder, because... Your intent or lack thereof is immaterial. And that's what these amendments are going to codify. That a man's intent is immaterial. Rape will become essentially a strict liability offense. They are also trying to set up a system in which a defendant cannot even raise reasonable doubt in which no evidence as to the conduct of the complainant, no matter how compelling or material to a defendant's reasonable belief that she consented, or to uh, her credibility um, as, a, as a witness, can be used to demonstrate that a complainant consented if she later claims to the police that she did not. 
or that the complainant's testimony is not credible or reliable, even when they perjure themselves on the stand. It's not allowed to be used for that. And somehow, Canada's attorneys aren't flipping their shit over this. They're just being real quiet, and I don't know why. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I consider the sort of mob rule that goes on on the internet to be a form of um, uh, trying to circumvent a logical argument by just sheer numbers. And it, when you go through the history of feminism, when you actually look through, that is the sort of thing that has actually set marginalized people back. You don't say marginalized people are marginalized when the mob rules. Like two wolves and a sheep voting on what's for dinner. <sighs> That's what due process of law is for, Leanna. That's why the state bears the entire burden in a criminal trial. It's not up to the defendant to make an argument, however persuasive or lame, to defend himself, even though he may sometimes do so. It is up to the Crown to prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt. You remove due process of law, and what you're going to get is the majority voting in crap that undermines the rights of vulnerable people and allows the state to become an agent of oppression. Is that idea of might is right and strength in numbers. I mean, there's a reason minority rights are a Western principle. The smallest minority is the individual, Liana. And in a democracy, the state is the representative of the majority, of the mob. This is the whole question of this, really, is how do we appease all these people that think that we have this giant issue when they've created a whole different picture of what it actually is. Mm -hmm. They've got this whole idea in their mind that one in four women are raped on campuses, that uh, Gomeshi was actually guilty, and that the whole system is, screw is screwing over victims. They've got this idea, and they genuinely believe it. They genuinely believe they're running yeah. out screaming shirtless that they feel victimized. They feel they're being wrongly treated in society. Mm -hmm. How do you appease these people? How do you fix that hole? Last question. You do it with facts, Liana. You explain to people the actual reason why the criminal system operates the way it does. You remind them that the Magna Carta, right, and all the reforms that followed it are one of the reasons we're able to have all these nice things, you know, like liberty and autonomy and private property and the ability to defend oneself against false and malicious charges. It's why we don't have um, lynchings you know, or uh, if we do, if we do have lynchings, like people are prosecuted for them. It's not the court perpetrating them. You remind them of Emmett Till and ask them if that's the society they want to live in. I am not a big fan of appeasement. Um, so I'll pivot the right. question a little bit to say, what do we do? Well, um, I think what's unique about the Gian Gomeshi case is you have a guy who admitted on a Facebook post in advance that he gets sexual gratification for beating the crap out of girls. Interesting way to put it. Although I will put it to you that Gomeshi's Facebook post more closely resembled all of the facts that came out at trial than did the testimony of any of the complainants. So, was he clairvoyant? Could he tell the future? Or did he know something about Lucy de Couture that the rest of us don't or didn't. He said in his post that his enjoyment of domination and mild sadism would be used to incriminate him, and it was. He said that the allegations against him were orchestrated by a former lover who wanted to spite him over his rejection, and who was actively solici soliciting other former partners who might be willing to make a complaint. And wouldn't you look at everything that came out at the trial... De Couture's testimony was entirely discredited by her own communications with Gomeshi after the fact, which looked very much like a woman smitten and politely rebuffed. She was demonstrated to have collaborated with another accuser before they even talked to police and between talking to police and the trial. Over hundreds of texts, she hired a publicist to help her negotiate media interviews in which she held herself up as a poster child for sexual assault victims, just basking in, in the glow of all of that virtue signaling going on. None of the complainant's stories checked out in any reasonable way, and contrary to what most people believe about this case, and as far as I've been able to ascertain, 
Gomeshi never had sex with any of them. And it wasn't because they were refusing. I mean, if we're going to talk about perverts here, I have to wonder how many times Lucy rubbed one out to the thought of Gomeshi being ass-raped in prison. Well, it's consensual, he said, of yes. course. But you still have this thing of a lot of people go, I don't get it. You know, and if you look at some of these crime of the century things like, you know, Fatty Arbuckle going back in the days, they violated their brand. He was a sensitive leftist male all of a sudden admitting he had this, you know, hide to his Dr. Jekyll who liked wailing on women in his private life while he was telling it to be nice and kind to everybody in his, in his public persona. That doesn't change. Yeah. And so to most people, they go, well, he is default a liar. We have proven that he is a liar. He showed us one face publicly and he had this entire face privately. So when he gets off, pardon the pun, on a sexual assault charge, people feel a real sense of injustice there. And that, Liana, is the smartest thing you've said in this interview. He violated his brand. The sensitive feminist guy who minored in women's studies likes to spank women in the bedroom. Jekyll and Hyde, indeed. Of course he's guilty. He gets off on hurting women. Never mind all those women out there who get off on getting hurt. And that's why the work I do in cyberbullying and gender and all this stuff, the legal system is a legal system. It is what it is. You talk to any politician. Trust me, I've tried. They say criminal reform is hard. It's very, very difficult. It takes a long time, and it's ugly, ugly work. Yeah. Yeah, ugly, like passing legislation that could effectively make it impossible for any man accused of sexual assault to bring evidence showing his accuser lied about what happened or showing that she actually had consented. You know, ugly like that. Community work is something we can do something starting today. And that's what I'm very bullish on. We have to, we have to start getting women collectively and, and individual survivors of sexual assault into a place where they can go, I am defined by what I do and not was done to me. I, I'm about solutions and I'm about having these conversations. And you know what? I hope you convince more feminists to do that because you might be their saving grace. <laughs> I'm trying. Okay, so we do have to wrap up here because uh, we've gone way over time, but it was a fascinating conversation. So thank you so much for coming on the show. This is probably the best thing that you said in this whole interview. And I know you're repeating what you said in the beginning, but I agree. The way to have a decent life as a self-actualized person is to focus on what you do uh, and not so much on what is done to you. And given that, I hope you are willing to consider why I may have criticized you in the past in the ways that I have. I called the content of the things you say functionally retarded. I have conceded that my words were harsh and I will apologize for the way I worded things. However, I did not call you functionally retarded. I said half the stuff you say is. And I hope I have outlined in this video some of the reasons why I feel you are often talking out of your ass and expounding on things that you don't know enough about. You accused me of picking a fight when I said in the comments of your video on Anita and Sargon that you have a poor understanding of the criminal justice process, how it works, and why it works the way it does. In my defense, I didn't say that to pick a fight. I provided it as an example of what I feel you get wrong and why I'm critical of you. In particular, I'm hard on you because you project a semblance of reasonableness even when you're saying things that are untrue or inaccurate. If you were just another feminine clone ripping off your top and screaming, Go meshy guilty, I wouldn't bother. But you're persuasive, even when you're wrong. You seem sane and rational, and you speak confidently as if you know what you're talking about, and because of that, some people are going to believe what you say. You have accused me of attacking you and even demanded an apology. I, I hope you are happy with the one that I was willing to give you before appearing on a Honey Badger podcast. Now how, I would ask you, is that focusing on what you do rather than what has been done to you? I don't have any hard feelings for toward you, Liana. I just hate seeing people spread misinformation that's, you know, that to, to spread information that's just wrong. That's why I uploaded your video on Sargon and Anita. I thought you got it right, right? You were talking about a hypothetical, if we're to take both of them at their word, right? And you went from there. 
And what you said made a lot of sense. And I know you said in this interview that you're not a lawyer, but you don't need to be one to learn how the process works and why, why it works the way it does. Um, these are stuff, uh, if you took a civics class, this is the kind of stuff that they would go over. Um, and if you've ever been party to a legal action, you would sort of have some idea um, or be able to find out about all of this stuff. Now, my dire sin, according to you, is that I was undiplomatic in how I worded my opinion of your ideas. And, okay, I said that your voice was like nails on a chalkboard, and I will apologize for that. Um, you, on the other hand, have gone on the public record to say things that are not only completely bogus, but that anyone with half an hour in the motivation can determine are bogus. But, again, why would they? You seem so reasonable. You're not even yelling. Anyhow, um, I think I'm going to have to split this into two videos. Sorry about that, everybody, but uh, it's just way too long. Um, but I will edit them and have them up uh, in the next a little bit and uh, maybe one day apart. And uh, I hope that this clarifies things for Liana. Um, and again, uh, you know, sorry I said that about your voice, but I am not sorry about, uh, I'm not sorry about saying that you often get it wrong. <laughs>